Hello, welcome to another lesson from the first module of my new course on networking fundamentals. This first module will teach you everything you need to understand how data flows through a network. In this lesson, we're going to continue our discussion of switches, and we're going to unpack everything switches do to facilitate communication within a network. In the first part of this lesson, we discussed MAC address tables and how they work, and the three actions a switch will take. If you haven't seen that video, go ahead and pause this video right here and watch that video first. This video is a direct continuation. In this video, we're going to introduce three more ideas. We're going to discuss unicast flooding and broadcast. We're then going to discuss VLANs. And finally, we're going to show you how these actions apply when multiple switches are involved. That said, let's get right into it. In the last video, we showed you how host A sent this frame to host D. We showed you that when host A put that frame on the wire, it arrived on port 5, which allowed the switch to learn this entry in its MAC address table. And then the switch had to flood this frame because it didn't know where the MAC address D4D4 existed. Now this frame was a unicast frame. The definition of unicast is a one-to-one -one communication. And you can tell this is a unicast frame because the destination MAC is another host. But what if instead host A had sent a broadcast? For instance, what if instead host A had sent an ARP request? Now we told you an ARP request is a broadcast frame, meaning it has a destination MAC address of all Fs. This is a specially reserved MAC address, which indicates that this content needs to be delivered to everybody on the local network. Well, if this frame was the first frame that host A had sent, the learning process would have been identical, because either way, the switch will have received something on port 5 with the source MAC address of A181. So this MAC address entry would have been the same. But since this is a broadcast frame, the switch wouldn't even look at its MAC address table in order to forward this frame. A broadcast frame is always going to be flooded by a switch. Unicast frames, however, are only sometimes flooded, specifically if the destination MAC address is not in the MAC address table. If, at the time of this frame arriving, the switch had known the location of the MAC address D4D4, then this frame would simply be forwarded directly out to host D. The difference I'm trying to point out is the terms unicast and broadcast have to do with a type of frame, and both of those are different from the term flood. Flood is simply an action that a switch will take, whereas a broadcast is an actual type of frame, specifically a frame with a destination MAC address all Fs. A switch will only do these three actions. A switch will never broadcast anything. The only time a switch is going to send a broadcast if traffic is going to or from the switch. But at that point, the switch is essentially acting as another host. So insofar as traffic going through the switch, a switch will never broadcast anything. A switch will only perform these three actions. So that is how unicast flooding is different from a broadcast. Again, a broadcast is always flooded, whereas unicast frames are occasionally flooded. So that wraps up our discussion on broadcast versus flooding, which brings us to VLANs. VLANs stand for Virtual Local Area Networks. In this section, we're going to briefly define VLANs, but only as much as needed as to discuss these switch actions. What VLANs allow you to do is they allow you to take a switch and divide the switch ports into isolated independent groups. I can group these ports into one isolated groups called VLAN 20, and these ports into another isolated groups called VLAN 30. Now, this switch essentially acts as multiple mini switches. And each of these mini switches are going to perform each of these actions independent from the other. Meaning the switch is going to maintain one MAC address table for VLAN 20 and another MAC address table for VLAN 30, and the switch will do all three of these actions confined to these isolated independent groups. That is what VLANs do, is they essentially allow you to create mini switches within the big physical switch. So you can see that these actions still apply if you're using VLANs. All you're doing is confining these actions to a specific set of ports. Now that is as far as we want to go in this lesson regarding VLANs. If you want to learn more about VLANs, I've created a video which discusses VLANs in more detail. There'll be a link in the description, and I'll also add a YouTube card right there. Furthermore, if you want to access all the content I've ever produced regarding VLANs, 
Simply type pracnet.net slash VLANs into your web browser, and you'll be taken to an index with links to everything we've ever produced about VLANs. Otherwise, we're going to continue in this lesson and discuss how switches operate when there are multiple switches involved. To illustrate this, we're going to use this topology right here. I'm going to show you how everything we discussed insofar as switches still applies if multiple switches are involved. Now, both of these switches are going to maintain their own independent MAC address table. They're not going to share information with each other insofar as what MAC addresses they know. They're simply both going to perform these three actions and populate their own independent MAC address table. And I'm going to show you how that works by showing you everything that occurs for a frame to go from host A to host B. Now, once again, this is a unicast frame. It has a destination MAC address of another host. So this illustration is going to start with the assumption that host A knows the MAC address it's trying to speak to, meaning we're going to leave ARP out of this. That said, when host A sends this frame out onto the wire, it'll arrive on the blue switch on port 1, which will allow the blue switch to learn a MAC address entry for port 1. Then the blue switch is going to look at the destination MAC address of that frame and realize it does not know currently where the host B exists. Therefore, it's simply going to flood that frame all other ports. The blue switch just did unicast flooding. Either way, host C will get a copy of this frame and will silently discard this frame since it is not the intended recipient. And now we can continue this process from the green switch's perspective. From the green switch's perspective, something just arrived on port 4 with a source MAC address of all A's. This allows the green switch to learn a MAC address table entry for port 4. Then the switch is going to look at the destination, and again, the green switch doesn't currently know where the all B's MAC address is, so the green switch is then going to perform the flood action and send this frame out all ports. Once again, the green switch will flood the unicast frame. Host D will get a copy of this frame and will silently discard it. Host B will get a copy of this frame, accept it for processing, and theoretically generate a response. This response will be sent from host B's MAC address to host A. When this response arrives on the green switch, the green switch will be able to learn the MAC address which exists on port 6, which is all B's. Then the green switch is going to look at the destination MAC address and realize that it does know how to deliver this frame, and it's going to send this out port 4. That would be the forwarding action. The blue switch will then have just received something on port 3 with a source MAC address of all B's. This allows the blue switch to learn the switch port to MAC address mapping for port 3. Then the switch is going to look at the MAC address table to determine that this frame should be sent out port 1, where it will forward this frame out port 1, where it will arrive on host A. So that's what needs to happen for data to get from host A to host B and back. And you'll notice all we did was simply use the information we discussed in the first video of this lesson and showed you how it applied to multiple switches. Now it's your turn. I want you to continue this illustration and map out the sequence of events for a frame to go from host C to host B and the response, and also from host C to host D and the response. If you do this, you'll have mapped out the entire complete MAC address table for both switches in this topology. I'll show you the full MAC address tables in about 10 seconds so you can check your work. Otherwise, Go ahead and pause this video right now and try to complete these sequences. If all of the hosts have spoken through this topology, then the MAC address tables for both the blue and the green switches would look like this. Notice in particular that it is totally acceptable and even expected for a single switch port to have multiple MAC address mappings. Port 3 on this blue switch will have received traffic from host D and host B with a source MAC address of all D's and all B's respectively. So it's perfectly acceptable and expected for port 3 to have multiple mappings on the blue switch. If you're able to follow through this exercise, then you can say you definitely understand switching at this point. And in all cases, a switch is only performing these three actions and maintaining a MAC address table. That is again how any device that claims to do switching is going to operate. What we just illustrated are simply the rules of switching. And that wraps up this lesson. In the next lesson, we're going to do the same, but for routers.
we're going to show you everything that a router does to facilitate communication between networks. I hope you enjoyed this video. I want to thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Hey YouTube, I hope you enjoyed that free lesson for my new course on networking fundamentals. I'll be releasing the entire first module for free here on YouTube. I want this course to be the ultimate networking fundamentals course. And since I'm still scoping out the outline, you could have a say in what topics will be covered. Let me know in the comments below what subjects you want included in this course. Otherwise, remember to like and subscribe. And of course, if you learned something from this video, the best way to thank me is to share this video. It's a small act of gratitude, but one I appreciate greatly. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I want to thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.